far this way as some people do. Go. Good morning, everybody online who's tuning in to our lecture today. Glad to see you. Actually, I can't see you. You can see me. You can see the people in the, in the room. Nice, cool day. It's a good day to be inside listening to a lecture, right? Taking notes, learning stuff. Um, I'm Your going microphone. to. Thank you. Now you should go to hear me. Oh yeah, there we go. I wasn't going, I wasn't connected. <clears throat> if I shout out, the people heard me though. So anyway, um, we're going to talk a little bit about vaccines today, and um, I'm just giving a couple of minutes for uh, people to be able to show up here, and then I will get started. <clears throat> but I'm going to cover vaccines mostly as they as it applies to uh, older folks. Um, and you may ask, what do you mean by older folks? Um, now it's, and we used to say old is 20 years older than the speaker, but that'll be pretty old now. Cause <laughs> now I'm getting to the point where I'm one of those older folks. Um, so anyway, um, I will go ahead and get started with the actual lecture. I'm assuming there are other people watching this A little intro here. Um, Hamilton <clears throat> from the uh, ha from the play Hamilton sings this, and he's talking about his opportunity rather than his shot. They didn't have vaccines, except they did have smallpox, I think, around that time. But uh, I just wanted to emphasize this: don't throw away your shot. So let's talk about the shots. This is going to be vaccines that are appropriate for adults in general, <clears throat> uh, people over 50 years of age. Uh, so there's tetanus, diphtheria, acellular pertussis, that's what Tdap is, <clears throat> influenza, uh, shingles, which is zoster, COVID-19, respiratory syncytial virus, and pneumococcal. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on special cases, but for the most part, people are gonna focus on people over 50. Starting with tetanus. <clears throat> Everybody knows about tetanus. Uh, a lot of people don't know what tetanus is. Um, it's been known uh, as lockjaw, it isn't very common because uh, to get into school, pretty much everybody has to have a, have a tetanus shot. Uh, to get into the military, you have to have a tetanus shot. To get into a lot of um, health professions, you have to have a tetanus shot. So a lot of people have been immunized. <clears throat> we give this tetanus shot every 10 years. Um, and it doesn't suddenly stop working in 10 years. Your immunity lasts for a long time thereafter. Most of the people in the United States who get tetanus are either illegal immigrants who've had no immunizations or very old people, 80s, 90s, who maybe had their last tetanus shot when they were 20, um, and so that's, it, it's finally worn off. <clears throat> so people think, well, I stepped on a rusty nail, I'm gonna get tetanus, and it really has nothing to do with rust, and it has nothing to do with nails. Uh, the, the tetanus is caused by a bacterium called Clostridium tetani. This lives as spores in the soil. Um, it's in feces. Farms are, are probably the most common place to find it, but you can, uh, you can get tetanus just about anywhere. So if you're outside puttering in the garden and you scratch your finger and you've not had a tetanus shot, um, you'll probably need to get one. <clears throat> we give it every 10 years. Uh, if you've got a tetanus prone injury, which is a, a, an injury that has been contaminated with soil and is not open uh, because Clostridium doesn't like oxygen. So an open uh, ragged wound is less likely to get tetanus than a puncture. We include with this diphtheria. Again, diphtheria is also rare, again, more likely to be uh, illegal immigrants who have been immunized. <clears throat> um, it's bacteria, Corinne bacteria. It's, this is a respiratory virus, and it causes a very bad sore throat, but that's not the problem. The, uh, the Corinne bacteria secretes a toxin that gets into the bloodstream and uh, affects your breathing and your muscles and so on. So it's a bad disease, but again, I've never seen it. It may be around. Um, adults, because most of the adults have had some diphtheria, they don't need as big a dose. So you'll see T, capital D, AP for children's version, because it's a bigger dose of the diphtheria, and T, little d, uh, for the adult version, because we don't need as much of a booster. And then the last one is pertussis, which is whooping cough. <coughs> um, we use, whooping cough was the one that used to give the most trouble for kids. The uh, vaccine used to be a virus, was the, actually the bacteria, Bordetella pertussis, it was killed, and the dead bacteria was injected into the kids. And some kids, the immune system said, 
oh, you're infected, we're gonna you know, make raise the temperature and make you really sick. So kids did get sick from it, some kids got seizures from it. They developed what's called an acellular pertussis. So it's not, the, it's not the bacteria cell, they actually take the antigens that the immune system responds to and then that's in the vaccine. So it just doesn't cause the kind of reactions that it used to. So that's what the AEP, it's acellular pertussis, so Tdap. <clears throat> Um, the biggest problem for uh, pertussis is that you need several doses of the vaccine to be immunized. Children get um, three shots, two, four, and six months of age, and then again at 18 months. By that point, they are fully immunized. We recommend that um, mothers, fathers, and grandparents who have not had a tetanus, or tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis booster in 10 years get one to make sure that they don't carry pertussis and transmit it to the baby who isn't fully immunized. So you may have been, if any of you have um, children, daughters um, or any family member of childbearing age, age who is pregnant, who has said to you, would you please get a tetanus shot? It's not for the tetanus, it's for the Tdap. <clears throat> flu. Um, flu is an interesting, the flu virus is an interesting virus. Um, we recommend an annual immunization. The reason is that the influenza viruses mutate. Influenza is worldwide. There are many different species. It infects horses and ducks and geese and chicks and ducks and geese. And <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna break into the song here, I'm sorry. Um, and the problem is that um, if two virus strains, if, if a virus strain that will infect humans is infecting an animal, with another strain, and the, their um, RNA is floating around inside, and the pieces can exchange, and then you get an entirely different genetic profile, and when it comes out, it could be worse. Now, sometimes those mixtures are not worse. Sometimes they won't even infect a human, <clears throat> or sometimes if they do infect a human, it's not that bad. And the other thing is this RNA is reproducing itself in, this, in the virus. Sometimes there are mistakes made and so that the, the uh, proteins that are on the surface of the virus are a little bit different. And, and so what we, gave, what we put in the shot for this year, it turns out it's not quite a good match because the mutations took place maybe in South America, and by the time it moves here, it's a little bit different. So, um, and, and just as it says, there are eight, there's two um, proteins, a hemagglutinin and a norminidase, so they're abbreviated as H and N. There are 18 H types, 11 N types. Not all of us do infect us, <clears throat> but you'll see them sometimes. This year's virus is an, is an H3N2A, and then the name of a place and a, and a number. And so that, that refers to where the strain was initially detected. Most of our viruses, most of our flu viruses for a long time have been H3N2. There's been a, there was a, a potent H1N1 a few years back. You may remember we had to get an extra shot because of this very potent H1N1. Um, the immunity that we get is not perfect because it's what has to happen is they have the CDC has to say we think this particular strain is going to be prevalent this coming year, and all the vaccine manufacturers try to produce something that's very close to it. And if they're lucky, it's really close. And if they're not lucky it's not very close and it's not a very good match. <clears throat> the best way, the best thing about this would be if everyone, 100% of citizens got immunized, the, le the likelihood of it spreading would be, would be really uh, reduced. There is a type B, a type C, and a type D. Type B is usually not severe. There's usually a B included in the vaccine, <clears throat> the one that they think is gonna be common. Type C, we don't worry about it, it doesn't hurt anybody, and type D goes in, uh, does not infect humans. We have, um, they developed a few years ago, they realized that the immune systems of those of us over 65 tend not to respond as well. So they developed um, a high dose uh, vaccine. There used to be three viruses that were included. Now there's four viruses that are included. That's why it's called the quadrivalent. Um, <clears throat> but there's the dose for people over 65 is, is uh, I think it's four times the dose of under 65. So if you've been getting flu shots every year and now you get this high dose one because you're older and you got a little sore, more sore arm and maybe a little more of a reaction, it's just because it's, you're getting a lot more antigen. <clears throat> um, I mentioned everyone. If everyone get vaccinated, we'd have herd immunity, um, but that's, that is a, that's a real wish. Um, 
People will tell me, I don't want to get the flu shot because it causes the flu. It doesn't. There's nothing living in the flu vaccine. It's all dead. It's all protein. Uh, but your immune system thinks you're being infected. And it, and it you know, musters the, the troops. And, every, and it tries to make all these antibodies. And then all of a sudden, it says, oh, wait a minute. There's no infection here. And everybody settles down. But sometimes you get a little fever. You get a little achy. Uh, and if your immune system is pretty overreactive, you might, it might last a couple of days, but it's better than getting the flu, because if you get the flu, it's going to be 10 to 14 days, and you could also get complications. <clears throat> so food doesn't go to the flu. You can, you can be, have the worst egg allergy in the world, and you get the flu vaccine. So that's a, that's a myth. There's no egg protein in the, in the vaccine anymore. Um, and some people come in, and they need um, tetanus, and they need shingles, and they need flu, and they need RSV, and they need zoster. You can get them all at once. Now, your immune system may say, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to protest, but you can get them all at once. Please. Pneumococcal. <clears throat> this is the one I won't let people leave my office until they get this. I don't care what they think about vaccines. So I'm going to lock in the door, and you're not getting out of here until you get this vaccine. Um, this is caused by a, a bacteria called streptococcal pneumoniae. And when you get strep pneumonia, this is usually the bacterium. But it does, that's not so much, it's not so much that we're trying to prevent pneumonia. This can also cause an invasive blood um, sepsis, and it is highly lethal. Uh, you can be very, very healthy and die before you even realize how sick you are. And this vaccine is extremely effective. Um, of course, the older you are, the more complications you have. If you have heart disease and lung disease, kidney disease, <coughs> diabetes, you're more likely to have a serious case of streptococcal pneumonia infection. Um, so. Obviously, if you're, you know, if you're older, you need to be, uh, be more wary. Um, now, people in this room have probably had the different pneumonia vaccines. Uh, for many years, we had what's called PPSV-23, um, and that was, a, um, uh, that was the one that was very widely prevalent. A number of years ago, the CDC said, we think that it would be better if everybody who had the original one, Pneumovax-23, also got PCV-23. 9 at the time, and then 13, and after a few years they said, it's not, the mortality rates are not going down, so we're just going to abandon the PCV-13. So I had a number of people that just got the PPSV-23, and I said, no, you're fine. But then they developed <clears throat> the uh, PCV-20, and it turned out that that works better by itself than any other combination. So anyone who's had, has been fully immunized prior to now doesn't need anything else. People who have started to get immunized are getting PCV20 and then they're done. And then if you're just getting into that frame, you'll just get PCV20. I have a big fold out now because it's so complicated. I have to look and say, okay, did you get this or this? And how old are you? And what complications do you have? Oh, well, you get this one. And after a while, it'll finally be easier. But it's, I always remark that those of us who are over a certain age and <coughs> graduated from medical school back in the, in the Stone Age, that Vaccines were very simple. There were like four of them. It was easy. And now so many vaccines, it's like, I go, oh my God. I have a nurse at the office who are, who's our, our vaccine expert. Sometimes I go to her and I say, will you please tell me which vaccine I'm supposed to use right here now? I mean, I, I have an app on my phone that helps me. I look up the age and the conditions and it tells you what you need. But that's how complicated it is. Shingles. Um, you've probably heard about this. Um, herpes zoster, which is, uh, which is also varicella zoster virus, it's one big family of virus. This causes chickenpox, and um, it's also called human herpes virus 3, you might see it, HHV3. Years ago, uh, those, those of us who were born in the 50s and to some degree the 60s all got chickenpox. Even if you didn't remember chickenpox, you had chickenpox. It's so infectious that anybody who was living or went to school in the 50s to 40s uh, had chickenpox. <clears throat> When the chickenpox goes away, the virus does not go away. The virus becomes dormant and lives in your nervous system. Your immune system keeps it dormant. But as we get older, um, some things don't work as well, and our immune system sometimes can't keep it under control. Now, the statistics are, for people over 50 is when the, the rates of shingles start to go up, but I've had patients in their 30s have shingles. This virus will become active again, and it, trans and it travels down the virus where it's, or excuse me, down the nerve where it's living, and causes a very painful rash on the skin wherever it happens to be. So it's a painful rash. <clears throat> Nobody dies from it, but it can cause some problems. It can cause a, a neuritis that will last for years afterwards. 
Um, and if it's near the eye, it can actually erupt into the cornea and cause the eye to, um, to open up and you can lose your vision. So the immunization is very useful to reduce the likelihood that that'll happen. We do have treatment for it. If you, if you get shingles, we have medication, antiviral medication, but you'll still get pain and you'll still get the rash. <clears throat> but the shingles vaccine, we recommend for um, two doses, everyone over 50. It's two doses, um, two to six months apart. If you have it, and you say, well, I never had chicken pox, so I'm not going to get it, but you did have chicken pox. Anybody before, born over 1957 is assumed to have had chicken pox. Between 57 and roughly 1995 or so, a lot of people did. So pretty much everybody needs to get the shingles vaccine when they get to 50. Um, respiratory syncytial virus, this is a new one you may not have heard about. It's been around a long time. And the only reason you are starting to hear about it is we now have a vaccine for it. When we didn't for a long time. Um, there's a lot of, it actually hospitalizes a lot of people, makes a lot of people sick, and kills a lot of people, including um, young children. Um, this is a respiratory virus. We have, the only thing we had for a long time was an antibody <clears throat> that we would give to newborns who were, who were coming in for well visits during the winter months, uh, and they would get it for the first two years, they'd get a shot of this antibody every month to try to um, prevent them from getting RSV. Um, if you have, obviously, the usual conditions, you're uh, at higher risk. Um, you might say, well, I'm fine, I'll take my risk, but again, if you have, uh, if you're gonna be exposed to newborns or pregnant women, you probably should get this so you don't transmit it to them. There's two vaccines, and if this gets, as vaccines are, they get, this gets complicated, but we have a shot that we give to women uh, during the last few weeks of their pregnancy and they'll make antibodies, and those antibodies will be transmitted to the baby so that when the baby's born, the baby will be less likely to get RSV, and they don't have to get the antibody shot every month. And then we have another vaccine for people over 60. Um, and uh, don't know if it's gonna have to be given regularly because it's fairly new, it's relatively safe. Um, I've, have, ha I haven't got a chance to get it yet. Um, I keep saying, I gotta get my RSV shot, but I haven't had it yet. But I haven't had, I have a number of people get it, and they haven't said anything about it's causing them any problems. Then there's some special situations if you're a healthcare provider, first responder, uh, if your employment uh, has you exposed to various things, traveling. If you're traveling, the CDC has a travel website that tells you whether you need to get prophylaxis against um, malaria or dengue or yellow fever or whatever. Um, it, uh, people who have men who have sex with men, people who have multiple sexual partners, people who um, inject drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's all sorts of other, of other complications. So that's the basic overview. Um, I tried to make this short because I thought maybe you might have questions. Um, uh, so I'll open the floor. Anybody? Yes. Sir? What's the, uh, I, I know I'm in this situation. I know a lot of other people they'll ask, did I have chicken pox when, I, when you were a kid? People get confused whether they had chicken pox or measles. They don't know which one it was. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, the chicken pox is a very itchy rash. It starts out as like a cold, <clears throat> and then you get bumps. They start out as little bumps that turn into blisters, and the blisters rupture and turn into scabs. Extremely itchy, um, and it tends to be over the whole body. Measles make you usually a little sicker with measles, and um, frankly, I haven't seen measles since medical school. Um, the uh, measles causes a sore throat. Uh, you get little spots on the, on the tonsils. Then you break out in a rash. Now there's German measles, which is rubella, and then there's uh, regular measles, root, which is root, uh, roseole, or uh, I can't remember the name of it, the regular measles. Mm -hmm. um, the, the German measles causes a finer rash, uh, a little bit less sick, but the problem with, with rubella is that pregnant women who get rubella can have uh, cardiac defects with the babies. Uniformly, um, if you get health care pretty much anywhere in the United States, they will check your rubella status, and if you don't have antibodies, you get an immunization. <clears throat> but um, it, it's, it, it's uncommon to see measles now. There's probably, I would bet that anybody who graduated from medical school since 1990 or so has probably never seen measles. Uh, maybe not even seen rubella. <coughs> and that's extremely, they're both extremely contagious. In fact, if we, the way it is now, if I were to see somebody in my office and say, oh my gosh, you've got measles, Stay in the room. We call infectious disease. Close off the room, you know, and and they go to the hospital because it's so uncommon. We don't know 
how sick they're gonna get. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, when we were kids, you got measles, stay home. Yeah. Yeah, right. so. Sir? Is it, po <clears throat> is it possible to mix vaccinations? Like, I have not had RSV yet because I haven't. Uh, I haven't had the, the new flu shot. I haven't had the new uh, COVID shot simply because I had COVID in September and was told to wait at least three yeah. months. So can you mix vac vaccinations? Okay, so if you had COVID, interestingly, that's like a, that's like a booster. Uh, and the only reason for waiting <clears throat> is that you already have an, an antibody boost, and if you get the shot, your antibodies are gonna eat it up, <clears throat> and it's not gonna be of any use, so you won't be harmed by it, but it's kind of a waste. Um, we've, we've estimated about three months for a booster, but for a lot of, uh, for a lot of immunizations, our immune system will respond as a boost if a certain number of months have gone by. I, there's probably research being done about this. I don't know what the ideal time is, but three months seems like a good time to wait after having had COVID. Um, if I, I don't give people a hard time if they say, I had my basic series, I had one booster, um, and, um, and I just and I had COVID a month ago, I say, okay, fine, just, let's just wait till next year. Because the, the current COVID vaccine, and this is, it used to be you had to have the basic series, then you had to have one booster, and you had to have a new booster. Everybody's getting the same one now. It's, it's been uh, reformulated as of September for the current Omicron strain that's around. So anybody who gets any, um, any COVID is going to be the, the newest one. So someone who had a, a COVID infection, you wait a few months or even wait until next summer and go ahead and get another booster. So why would you get another booster? <coughs> um, the more times you get your immune system boosted, the more protected you are. Is there an ideal number of shots? I don't know. I've had seven. So, you know, um, I, I always tell people that, um, and I'll get to the rest of the question in a second, but I always tell people that um, some of the, the most important uh, advances we've had in medicine, some of the, the um, improvements in, our, in the overall health of the population have come from a couple of things. Immunizations have prevented lots of diseases. When I was just getting out of medical school, in the 80s, I had children in the hospital with uh, meningitis, with pneumonia, asthma. Um, we had ear infections all day long. The, the medical literature was just filled with articles about ear infections. I don't even see them anymore. Because we immunized children against the, bac the, the bacteria, the two main bacteria that cause ear infections, that cause meningitis, and that cause um, a lot of the pneumonias. So better health. <clears throat> and the other would be public sanitation and food, uh, food safety. Between those two things, have done more than doctors, more than surgeons that have ever done. It's all about public health. So, how, which ones can you mix? The, 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 you should not. The you know, one thing is a live virus, and we don't have, we don't use live viruses anymore. Shingles used to be a live virus, but it's not anymore. Um, if you get a live virus, you have to wait a while before you get other ones complicated sort of explanation, but you can get them all together. Uh, if you get them, most people aren't gonna to wanna to give you too many because we're afraid that if you feel ill, you know, we don't know if you're having a reaction or whatever. Um, but yes, you can get RSV and COVID together, you can get RSV and, and um, shingles together, you can get flu and RSV together, flu and COVID together. It's okay to get them together. They don't mix them in the same syringe, which would be nice, but you can get them at the same time. Sure. Uh, COVID, what causes variations of it? As you know, it, it almost sounds like it's a little person that gets smart and then he wants to change over to this. But realistically, why is there variations? Yeah, why does it, what causes viral mutations? Um, yeah, they're very smart. They go to school and they'll say, what's going on? What can we do to overcome these antibodies? Um, When a virus reproduces, um, the virus has coatings around the outside that attaches to our respiratory cells. Now, this is another whole interesting thing. Not every, they, it attaches to a particular chemical called sialic acid, and different people have different forms of sialic acid and different uh, types of receptors, so it attacks some people better than others. But once it gets on there, the membrane opens up 
and the genetic material goes into the cell and it takes over the cell's uh, mechanism for reproducing. So just like our cells will divide and we make more DNA, it'll take over that and make more of its own gen genome. And what it'll do is this, this genome opens up, you know, there's, normally it's like a spiral, it'll open up and little um, messenger RNAs get on there and pick up information and then picks up stuff from the genetic and, and it recreates another virus. But, you know, there's maybe a million, I forget exactly how many units. So there could be typographical errors, if you will. So they're putting all these little nucleosides in and then one goes in and it's not exactly the same one that was in there before. And that changes. So then when that is, is, is starting to make proteins to assemble the virus again, the proteins on the surface of the virus may be just a little bit different. So proteins have a have a certain conformation. They look like something. So if the, if the protein looks like this and your antibody looks like this, it fits. But if the protein looks like that and your antibody can't get there because it's got this little thing sticking out there, it's not going to be able to fight it off. So this, and you can imagine with quintillions of viruses floating around, reproducing all the time, you can imagine that, I mean, if you had to, just imagine if we had like, let's get a million people, we're going to copy some piece of literature, maybe, you know, war and peace, on paper. And if you go through it, you're going to find errors. It's the same thing with the viruses. There's going to be little mistakes. And then if our immune system can identify them, great. This is why they, you, see in the, you might see in the paper, there's a new strain came out, and our immune system will recognize it because it doesn't change the proteins that much on the surface. Our antibodies can still, if you already have antibodies, it's still going to work. But they always watch if there's a big, big change. Are people responding? Can they respond to it? Can, can, can they inactivate it or at least get a hold of it? And that's the, always, that's the same with the flu. That's always the big concern is that the virus will mutate because viruses are very unstable. It doesn't happen with bacteria as much. For example, pertussis. Pertussis hasn't changed that much. Bacterial genome is, uh, is different. It's, it's uh, more stable. Um, viruses are not actually living things. They're, they are basically inert. Uh, they're, they're, little, they're little monsters, basically, is what it, what it comes down to. If you could imagine the, the worst possible thing, they just do their thing. There's no thinking about it. They just do it. The interesting thing I think about COVID, and from a biological point of view, a lot of people died in the beginning, the first couple of years. I mean, millions of people died. And then fewer people died, partly because of immunizations. But the COVID virus has become less lethal. And why is that? Because if COVID became more lethal and killed everybody, there'd be no hosts. If COVID wiped out the population of the Earth, COVID would have no place to go, and it would go away. So from a biological point of view, survival demands that there be a host. And so it just makes us ill, and some people die, but it's still there to pass on. And it's the same with the flu. Yeah, so from a biological point of view, it's very interesting. And you think, these viruses all getting together and having little meetings and deciding what they're... Well, you take North America this year, and because I had them last year. <laughs> yes? John, um, so uh, you may have already mentioned this, but I have a friend who just had um, surgery on her neo um, a few uh, weeks ago, and she said that she was told by her doctor not to take that um, the COVID uh, booster because uh, it can cause blood clots. Did you mention this at all? Because I may I didn't mention it because it's not that big a deal. Um, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you will do everything you can to protect that joint that you just put in, and that makes sense. You know. Um, the, the technique of orthopedic surgery, joint replacement, is so much more refined than it used to be. <clears throat> but the one thing they don't want is an infection in the joint. That is horrible. And then they don't want blood clots. So uh, when you cut into bone, you release uh, chemicals that increase the likelihood of a blood clot. So if you have a joint replacement, you will be on anticoagulants for a period of time. Um, I know of no literature that indicates that COVID vaccine increases the likelihood of a blood clot 
related to surgery. Now, I'm sure there's people studying it. And if I did a literature search, I could probably find something. Um, COVID vaccine has a, uh, and I can't quote the percent, but a small percentage of small blood clots that can be associated. It's usually young men who get those. It's much more common in young men. Um, if you are, if you have joint replacement and you are on the normal anticoagulation protocol, and then maybe after that's up, you take aspirin as preventative and you get the COVID vaccine, the likelihood of you having a problem with that joint or a blood clot that's gonna be a problem is very small. And most of the blood clots that people get are small and manageable and are not gonna interfere with the surgery. But if you're the surgeon, you're gonna say, I don't care about any of that stuff. You know, I want this joint to be okay. And so don't, don't tell me, you know, that the risk is low or anything. I, I, I can understand that. Um, Okay, so COVID, because uh, there are some alternative sites to listen to that uh, another friend said that it causes blood clots and cancer. Oh yeah, so, cause there, oh sure, it so, causes pregnancy and hair loss and you know yeah, infertility yeah. and everything. No, it doesn't do any of that stuff. So here's the problem with websites. Um, most of us went to school at a time when they taught us to how to go to the library and look stuff up, and they said. You know, don't just pull any book off the shelf. You know, they got to look at the book and see what the, what's, who wrote the book and what's their, what is their, their authority. It's the same thing with looking stuff up on the internet, except it's worse. Everyone's an expert. That's Anybody true. with a computer or a smartphone is an expert, and they can publish anything they want, and they don't have to have any evidence, um, and they can say whatever they want. And it drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I say to people, well, you know, my MD degree trumps your Google search. <laughs> um, and if somebody comes in and, they, and they're coming from a reputable thing, you know, looking at Mayo Clinic or University of Pennsylvania or even Penn State or uh, CDC, uh, or they know how to do a pub, PubMed search and they're showing you articles, but then you have to interpret the articles too. You have to understand what you're reading. Um, so yeah, there's a small risk of small blood clots in young men, a much lower risk. And here's the thing, the disease also causes this. Blood clots are a hundred times more common in COVID disease than in COVID vaccine, and they're worse. And then you've got respiratory problems on top of it. So you might have a blood clot in your lung if you get COVID, as opposed to a little blood clot in your leg. And what do we do? We put you on an anticoagulant, and you'll be fine. So uh, anything that could be associated with the vaccine is far worse with the disease. How about the cancer thing? Oh, cancer. Um, Correlation does not imply causation. That's the first rule of statistics. So um, you get a shot, and then the next week they find that you've got a lump in your breast, right. and you think, oh, that must have been the vaccine today. Well, the lump in the breast has been developing for years, or they find you've got a lump in your pancreas, or you've got a colon tumor, or something like that, or you end up with a blood cancer. Right. Cancer doesn't arise. Or you might say, well, I had COVID shot last year, now I've got lymphoma. Okay, well, if you had a car accident, could you blame the vaccine? You know, If you fell down and broke your leg, can you blame the vaccine? It's, it's, yeah, you have to look and say, could that be? And you know, and scientists don't just say, you know, don't, don't bother me with your stupid questions. They actually look at this stuff and they look at it and they look at, I have seen more articles on um, uh, hydroxychloroquine and COVID Again, I mean, I'm going to come and say another article about hydroxychloroquine, but haven't we proved that this doesn't do anything? Um, oh, and um, what's the other one? Oh. Paxlovid. 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 Paxlovid um, does. That, that's, that's, that's actually an antiviral thing. No, um, a Prozac. Oh, right. Oh. Yeah. So now it's interesting. There's actually a little bit of evidence that an antidepressant might help a little bit, but, you know, it's not like really good. So. And everybody's an antidepressant anyway, right? So, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. Um, you have to you have to really be able to understand the studies, and you have to understand, you know, you have to understand your your sources, and you have to understand the, the thing they're talking about. And, um, and and if you read something, and somebody says this happens, well, how do you know? You know, show me the mechanism, um, show me the statistics, and. Does it make sense? We hear, we hear about blood clots all the time, uh, going to the heart, going to the, the lungs. What exactly is a blood clot? 
Um, so our blood has um, the ability to plug up holes. So if you cut yourself, you will eventually clot those veins and they'll stop bleeding. Um, when, when, when there is, okay, so there's, the blood clotting system, there's, there's two sort of same types of it. I don't want to turn this into a hematology lecture because um, this has been one of the most we've observed since medical school. Um, we have um, platelets which usually respond to an injury to a blood vessel. Um, the platelets will aggregate in response to chemicals that are released when there's tissue damage and they'll start to cl clog something. But there could be other reasons platelets can get aggregated. So for example, you can have um, cholesterol deposition in your coronary arteries and if you have enough cholesterol that that the, the, the loom and the space inside the artery is almost all completely taken up, <clears throat> that surface of that cholesterol thing might start to leak and the platelets then adhere to it. It thinks it's an injury. And when they start to adhere to it, they can form an initial clot in the coronary artery. That will, that will likely cause you to have angina, chest pain. And then once that's done, there's chemicals released that start to bring in the clotting factors. We have a whole series of proteins in our blood that then form a mature clot. And when that happens, you can have a heart attack. The, the body also has clot lysis, has chemicals that will break up clots. So we are always, if you sit in, in here and listen to this lecture for an hour, you may have formed a small blood clot somewhere, but you've got a, uh, a plasminogen system that will break up the clot. If everything's working right, it'll break it up. Or you might be on an anticoagulant, so you're not as likely to get an actual blood clot. <coughs> so, you can get, now people, some people have uh, too much of the of one type of protein that causes blood clots and not enough of the one that helps to break it up. And so, so these are people who have to be on anticoagulants their whole life because they're always going to have a spontaneous blood clot. Um, there, there are many conditions like immobility, surgery, uh, so on, that start to spread um, clotting, uh, stuff that's, that induces clotting. And so those people are more inclined, inclined to get clots. So you, act, you can either activate the clotting factors, or you can activate the platelets, which then activate the clotting factors, and then depending on where you get the blood clot. Now, you want a blood clot if you have a cut, but you don't want a blood clot in your leg that breaks off and sends it to your lung. Um, people have, um, well, there are a number of different conditions that can make you predisposed to clotting. Um, and, and that's, there's 12 clotting factors, I think. And some people have not enough of one factor, too much of another factor. Now, there are people who have some of the factors missing, hemophiliacs, or missing factor eight, or they don't have enough of factor seven. Um, and so they don't form good clots because they don't have enough of the clotting factors to form a clot. So they end up um, getting bleeding episodes. And they have to be given the clotting factors. Does that, make, that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Hmm. Another thing, another thing I always wondered is you have good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and everybody thinks cholesterol is bad. What is good cholesterol? <laughs> um, good question. When it comes from your favorite food, it's good cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good cholesterol we had today. Um, yeah. So cholesterol is the name for um, a group of uh, things in our blood called lipoproteins. The lipo means fat, protein means protein. So uh, our cholesterol is bound up with proteins. And there's, there's all different kinds. There's, um, there's high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, very low density lipoprotein, intermediate density lipoprotein, and then there's all sorts of remnants and so on. So we make cholesterol in our livers, and cholesterol is used, uh, just cholesterol in general, is used to make uh, Skin cells, it makes cells, it's structural. All our cells, cell walls are made up of a good bit of cholesterol. Also cholesterol goes into the adrenal glands because a lot of our sterile, well, sterile hormones are made from cholesterol. Our uh, um, testosterone and estrogen are made from cholesterol. So we need cholesterol. If we had no cholesterol, we'd be a mess. Um, in the process of making cholesterol, um, it gets sort of recirculated. So cholesterol goes out, and some of it gets used, and it's floating around, and then it comes back through the liver, and the liver says, we're gonna take some of this up, because bile that we use to absorb fat, which is stored in the gallbladder, 
is also made up of cholesterol. So the liver takes it in, makes it more a little bile. In the process of taking it in, uh, it can release little, little particles. Now, if you don't metabolize fat well, you might have high triglycerides. That's a whole other thing. Triglycerides are carried in a particle called very low density lipoprotein, VLDL. And if you have a lot of triglycerides, the liver's got to take some of that out, doesn't always do it. And in the process of trying to fix this, you end up with, with either an intermediate density or a low density lipoprotein. Now, this density means it, what they used to always measure the stuff they put in a centrifuge, and the stuff that was heavier went down to the bottom, and the stuff that was lighter stayed at the top. But now they do it through uh, the chromatography, a whole different other thing. Um, so this goes through the liver, and if you have a lot of these low density lipoproteins, intermediate density lipoproteins, um, they they stick to the arteries, and if you if your arteries so your arteries are lined by uh, an endothelium, what's called an endothelium, and that's a whole other that's almost like an organ in itself. <clears throat> and depending on your endothelium, if you're a smoker, if you have genetic predisposition, uh, if you have if you have some sort of anti-inflammatory process going on, your endothelium is more avid for this LDL to attach to it. And when it does, it sticks, and then the immune system comes in and attacks it and scars it down, and then more cholesterol comes in and the immune system does it. Pretty soon you build up layers that cause a blockage in an artery. HDL, the good, we call the good cholesterol, if you have enough of that, that helps to pull the bad cholesterol out of the circulation and into the liver. A lot of people don't have enough of the HDL because their livers don't make enough of it. Um, so, if you have a lot of LDL, get the bad cholesterol, the one that actually causes the harm, and you have a lot of the VLDL, which has the triglycerides, and you have not enough of the HDL, we have to decide what is going to do it. If you are overweight, we want it to lose weight. If you don't exercise, we want you to exercise. Exercise helps the endothelium to get better. Exercise helps to lower the LDL and make more of the HDL. Weight loss helps to clear up the VLDL. Um, if you have diabetes, that increases the risk. It gets pretty complicated. But the short answer is it's called good cholesterol because if you have a lot of it, it helps to keep your system a little cleaner. And it's called the bad cholesterol because if you have a lot of that, it's bad for you. It tends to clog your arteries. Is there a percentage assigned to that LDL, HDL? <clears throat> they, we look at percentages. Um, I don't, go, don't put a lot of stock in that. Just look at the number. Now, here's this is my, my controversy. Um, if you look at the, the cardiologists, I don't mean cardiologists, but the Car Merck College of Cardiology says um, that if, you, if your 10-year cardiac risk is below a certain number, it doesn't matter what your LDL is unless it's really, really high. And, and I say that's wrong because the cardiologist is focusing on, on whether the cardiologist is going to have to do anything to your heart. So look at 10-year risk. Um, my, I, I've been practicing now for... 47 years, and I look at a 50 plus year risk. So if you come to see me and you're 30, and your father had a heart attack or a stroke, or your grandfather, both your grandparents died of heart attacks or strokes, and your cholesterol is a little high, I want you on a statin now. I don't want to, because that person's cardiac risk, 10 year cardiac risk is going to be low because they're in their 30s. But if they have a heart attack, their cardiac risk goes way up. Or if they have really, you know, if they get angina, I don't want to wait for that to happen. So I treat people more aggressively. So I look at the actual number. <clears throat> um, technically, the, the, the official word is if your LDL is less than 130 and your HDL is above 40, that's okay. But that may be okay if you are thin and you exercise an hour a day and you've never smoked and you don't have diabetes and you eat a vegetarian diet, but the average American doesn't fit that bill. And if you had that, that pattern, uh, I think you need to have, be on something. I, I believe, I firmly believe, that the LDL, the, the normal LDL, is less than 100. And the normal HDL is over 40. And here's why I think that, and this is, this is not a good way to, this is not good support, but this is what I think it is. Over the years, I've had many, many patients who have normal cholesterol and have heart disease. Um, and they get on a statin, they go and have a heart attack, they put you on a high potency statin to try to keep it from having to happen again. When I was in medical school, 1973, I started, we had no idea what normal cholesterol was. They said 300 average, that's normal. 300, which is crazy when you think about it. 
So they took blood from all the first year students and they just wanted to do, you know, see what the cholesterol was. Now at that time, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. I did no exercise and I smoked a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. And I've had no heart disease in my family for many generations. My LDL was 87 and my HDL was 52. And now that I exercise and my weight's close to normal and I don't smoke, I haven't smoked in a long time. And my LDL went up a little bit, it does with age, but um, I, I, I really I truly believe that normal LDL is less than 100. So I want your LDL to be less than 100. And the other thing, the dementia. A lot of people aren't worried about heart attacks, but they are worried about dementia. Dementia is a big problem huge numbers of people living long enough to get dementia because we prevent them from getting pneumonia and dying and having you know anything that's going to kill you at a younger age. Um, so there's a lot of statistics, a lot of studies. Here are things that lower your risk of dementia. Regular vigorous exercise, vegetarian diet or mostly plant-based diet, um, not smoking, normal weight, um, that's a regular exercise, control of blood sugar, um, control of blood pressure, um, and control of cholesterol. So if you're on a statin, it lowers your risk of, of dementia. Mediterranean diet lowers your risk of dementia. But it's really hard to conduct a study that shows I'm going to take a group of people and I'm not going to treat them with a statin and another group of treat them with a statin and then see who gets dementia later on. So one of the things I look at when I see you is not just what your risk of a heart problem is or a stroke, what's your risk of dementia 50 years from now? And if your cholesterol is a little bit high, I talk about exercise, I talk about diet, I talk about you know, control your blood pressure, et cetera. But I want you on a statin if your LDL is above 100, because I really truly believe that we're going to reduce your risk of dementia. If there's, dementia is a, is a broad term. It's a lot more than just one thing. It's not just Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I think that I've had people who've been on statins, they get into the 90s, they get a little bit of dementia, and then they die because they're old, you know? And, uh, and so if you get dementia in the last six months or year of your life, that's a whole lot different than going 20 years with dementia. Um, so I, I, am, I am a firm believer now. It's very hard for me to hand you evidence that says it, but I, if you follow the Mediterranean diet, if you exercise, if you have normal weight, you don't smoke, all those things that reduce your risk of atherosclerosis. And I believe dementia is an atherosclerotic disease. I don't think it has anything to do with beta amyloid. You know, there's all these articles about this these infusion, antibody infusions that are gonna take the beta amyloid out of your brain. I think beta amyloid is the result of the atherosclerosis. I don't think it's the cause of the problem. Um, and none of these things have had any, any great benefit and a lot of them cause brain, brain bleeds. Um, so that's my, sorry, I'm off on a tangent here. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't mention alcohol. What's the impact of alcohol on the aging brain? Um, <clears throat> well, that's really controversial. Because for a long time, there was the, the, the party line was uh, a couple of drinks a day, like red wine, might be useful. Um, it, it, there's no easy answer to that. Uh, um, excess alcohol. So what's excess alcohol? More than two standard alcoholic beverages a day for a man, more than one standard alcoholic beverage a day for a woman is excess alcohol. Uh, drinking more than um, than half the week is potentially excess alcohol, or one day a week where you have more than six to, six drinks in a day, that's excess alcohol. Now, what, if you do it once on New Year's Eve and never again for the rest of the year, you probably aren't really doing anything to yourself. Um, but everybody's response to alcohol is different. We metabolize it differently. Um, the best thing I tell people is this: try not to get drunk. Just take it easy with, with, you know, have a drink if you want to, if, if you like wine with dinner, if you like a mixed drink with dinner, fine. But just be cautious, be judicious, because all the evidence isn't in yet. I don't think it's a big deal. Part of the problem with alcohol and other addictive substances is um, some people have a predisposition to abuse, and uh, we don't know who you are until you start using the thing. Um, um, one of the reasons that we tell children not to drink alcohol till they're 21 is because the immature brain is more susceptible to addiction. If they have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism and they start drinking under 21, they are much more likely to become alcoholic within two years. Whereas an adult with a mature brain might take longer, but they could still get addicted to alcohol. 
Um, if you take a drink because you need it, uh, you know, if you feel like I gotta get home and get a drink, you gotta be careful. You can have a problem. Um, I just have the same thing with narcotics. If I have patients and they've got pain for some reason, I say, I'm just gonna give you a couple of days of, of oh man, I'm worried about them. Get, you know, I don't wanna get addicted. Da, 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 da. I'm not worried about them. It's the person who says, you think five milligrams is enough? That worries me. You know? Or if they say, well, you're gonna give me this, but I'd rather have this. You know, that's, that worries me. Um, people in chronic, in chronic pain is a whole other thing. I could almost talk about all that, hold another lecture on that. I tell my students, and residents, if somebody has chronic pain, do not give them narcotics because chronic pain doesn't respond to narcotics. Chronic pain is a neuropathic problem. It's a problem with the nerves. Narcotics are for acute pain. Fall down, break your leg, have surgery. <clears throat> you, need nar you need narcotics are gonna work best for that. Um, if you have chronic pain, the narcotics will help for a little while, but then your body becomes tolerant to it and then you need a higher dose. And then you need a higher dose. Now, if you're not, a, if, you're not, if you don't have a predisposition to narcotics addiction and you get increasing doses, at some point you're gonna say this isn't working. But what happens to some people is you get a narcotic, and narcotics don't last that long, so the blood level goes up, and they feel okay, and then the blood level goes down. What they're having is narcotic withdrawal. And they say, I need to have my dose because, and, and I have people, they, they call up, I'm out of med, I got to have my dose every four hours, every six hours. These people are addicted. And it's really hard to get people not to do that. You know, it's really hard to get people over that. They have to really be motivated to say, I don't want to do this anymore. It may be fine if you're younger, but when you get older and you're in chronic narcotics, it increases your risk of falling, which then increases your risk of breaking something. So, sidetrack. Yes, sir. I, I, there, I see a lot of ads on TV for Prevagen. Um, and uh, it's an over-the-counter medication, which is interesting. Um, I think it's, I looked at it, it costs like a dollar a pill, 30-day supplies, $30 or more or less. $39. And um, I was wondering, do you have patients who come to you and say, should I, I'm, I'm taking Prevagen, uh, but I, I you know, how, or do you recommend Prevagen? Yeah, so Pre the question is about Prevagen. Do I have patients who ask about it every week? I do. Um, What's it for? Have any of, have any of you had the, the, uh, the occasion to say, I don't remember where I left my car keys, or, um, what were we talking about earlier today? And thinking, oh my God, there goes my memory. So I gotta do something about it. And um, um, memory efficiency diminishes as we get older. Um, we don't recall as quickly, but we can recall. And this can be, we can test for this. Um, the memory worries, things we worry about for dementia are, I'm out driving and I can't remember how to get home. That's a problem. Or I've got this thing that I've used all the time. I forget how to turn it on. And not a computer, because they're all different. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Prevagen. So they did some study with, I think it was rats, where they gave an extract from um, uh, jellyfish, and they completed the maze a little faster. So if you're a rat in a maze, get that Prevagen, because it's going to help you. Is that what's in it? Jellyfish. Yeah, it's a jellyfish extract or something, yeah. Um, I, when this came out, I went to the store and I pulled a bottle down and I, looked at the, and I said, okay, wait a minute. And I looked it up. And there's, no, there's really no, no credible research at all. I think there's one, one article. I, I did, went to PubMed. I went to every place. I went to the, to the uh, Provagen website. There's nothing. So does it help memory? It helps rat memory. Uh, I just can't believe, I, I, I don't think it's gonna help, no. If I thought it was gonna help, I'd be taking it, I'm not taking it. And I say to people, if it, if it was gonna help, I'd be prescribing it for you. The best thing is to get on your statin, exercise regularly, you know, all that other stuff. That's gonna do a lot more than the Prevagen. So. And the other thing about supplements, here's another, the word supplement means in addition to other stuff. So if someone's coming in and they're not exercising, and they're eating the wrong stuff, and they're overweight, they're smoking, and they want to supplement, I say, you have nothing to supplement. You gotta get all this other stuff. You know, if you're doing everything right, 
And then you want to take some turmeric because if it's anti-inflammatory process of properties, you might get you might get some benefit from that. Um, there's one supplement I do recommend to older people: glucosamine and chondroitin um, for joints. And before you have a damaged joint, um, I again it's hard to study this. The studies are done for arthritis. It won't help arthritis because your cartilage is gone when you have arthritis. But I, I just anecdotal. I have a lot of people I recommend this to. A lot of people feel, you get to a certain point where you start saying, my joints are a little achy when I go up and down the stairs. Um, maybe it's you know, a little stiff. So 1,500 milligrams of glucosamine and chondroitin is usually together. Uh, try for a month. If, you're, if your knees, it's usually knees. If your knees feel better, um, keep taking it. If it doesn't, doesn't make a difference, it's something other than a cartilage issue. Cartilages in our weight-bearing joints are the ones that are most affected. So our hips and our knees. Um, it's not going to help you so much with your fingers. Um, cartilage is made up of glucosamine. Uh, glucosamine is formed into chondroitin, which is mostly what makes up the substance of cartilage. So um, what this probably does is it helps hold water in the cartilage so that the cartilage is more flexible. Um, if, you, uh, if you have older cartilages without much water, they're more susceptible to strain injuries. So that's my supplement. Don't supplement until you've done all the basic stuff. Then you can supplement. How many milligrams? Fifteen hundred. Hundred. Yeah, they usually come in like five hundred, seven fifty tablets. So and they're big. Yeah, they are. Sorry. They are. Yeah, they're big. Yeah. yeah. I take. I've been taking a couple every day for a while because. You know, they crush them up and some. Yeah. You could. Yeah. You could. So, I don't want to. If somebody else has a question, please ask it. But somehow a question came up when we talked about the water and the joints and so forth. I thought about the Tom Brady water diet where he was drinking, uh, what, 200 uh, uh, ounces a day? Uh, or he recommends that you, 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 you consume your weight in ounces of water every day. Um, any wait, any, no, any, any comments on that? <coughs> Let me see. <laughs> um, Okay, if you have normal functioning cardiovascular system and kidneys, you can drink all the water you want. You're gonna fill your gut up and you may start getting some loose stools because you can't absorb it fast enough, but hopefully your heart will pump it through your kidneys and you'll pee a lot. Um, and I always tell people, you know you're drinking enough, then how much should I drink? Well, if, you're, if you have to, if you have a full bladder every um, three hours, you're drinking enough. And that's pretty much what it comes down to, about every three hours. Uh, so in summertime, you might need more to do that. And in the wintertime, you might need less. Um, the only thing about drinking a lot of water is your stomach's always filled with water, so you don't want anything else. One of the things that filling a stomach does, because we many diets have included like fiber, <clears throat> um, when your stomach is full, it uh, secretes um, uh, GLP, glucose-like uh, peptide. Glucagon-like peptides, sorry, GLP. So you heard of Wachovia and um, Ozempic that people are using to lose weight. These are synthetic versions of that hormone, and it makes you feel full. So when your stomach is full, you secrete your actual GLP, and it tells your brain, oh, stomach's full, so you're not hungry. So yeah, you can do that. Now, if you have heart failure, kidney disease, um, you know, you, have, you shouldn't be overdoing it, because if your kidneys can't clear it out fast enough, it'll build up in your body, and you go into heart failure. Um, so yeah, just just drink enough that you have to pee about every. Um, it's not a magic formula. formula. There's no magic formula. Speaking of peeing every 19 minutes, just another thing people ask me about is, I get up at night to pee, you know, three times or whatever. So if you're not having trouble breathing and you're just getting up because you made enough urine, we we cycle our, our sleep cycles every um, 90 minutes. We go from wakefulness to deep sleep through stages, and it, and that happens starting from birth around age two, when we finally learn to sleep through the night, um, we still cycle, but it's only for like a second. And you may remember in your 20s, your 30s, you wake up, it's two o'clock, oh, not time to get up, go back to sleep. Sometimes you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and say, it's not time to get up. But, but um, the other thing that happens is we make a hormone called vasopressin. And normally at night, when it's dark and we're asleep, we make more vasopressin, it diminishes the amount of urine we make so that you don't have to get up in the middle of the night to pee. And that goes on from childhood through adulthood. And at some point, 
60 to 70 years of age, you stop making that as much vasopressin at night. So you make as much urine during the night as you do during the day. So if you're drinking, you have to pee every three hours, and you wake up every 90 minutes. And so you wake up and you say, I must have to pee. And you go in, and sure enough, you have to pee because you're getting rid of all the urine. Um, but it's not necessarily that you have to pee. So I tell people, look, if you can get back to sleep, get up and pee. But if you're having trouble, ask yourself, do I have my bladder full? Do I feel like I've got the to go? If not, just stay there. 90 minutes later, it'll come up again. <laughs> Two minutes on the broadcast. Two minutes. Oops. Hang on now, I'm getting a phone call. Sorry. <laughs> Hello? Hang on, hang on, give me two minutes, I'll play back. Two minutes. Two minute warning. <laughs> Any other questions? I guess we'll sign off then. You didn't mention anything about vitamins. Yeah, vitamins are essential in your food. Yeah, yeah, in your food, but you don't recommend other than that. One of them. You don't remember any calcium. For me, they recommend calcium. Yeah. So, so calcium is not a vitamin, that's a nutrient. nutrient. That's um, true. Uh, and so women, um, because women lose female hormones at menopause, right. and you'll lose calcium. You need enough calcium. You're, you're always constantly losing and building. You need enough calcium in your diet so that it will be there to, to build up your bone. If, right. Now, if you have osteoporosis, it's a whole other thing. So you need, extra, you need that calcium. Um, vitamin D is very controversial. We probably don't need as much as everybody seems to think we do. It probably doesn't help us prevent cancer. Uh, if you want to take some, it's hard to overdose on vitamin D as long as you don't get huge bottles of it and take it all at once. Um, you should not take extra vitamin A because it's toxic in large quantities. Um, the B vitamins, if you take extra, you will have expensive urine. Um, if you're eating vegetables, and, and so your diet,